Okay, I'm here today with Jay Seeger of Starting Point Ministries. Starting Point Project. Starting, <laughs> starting Point Project. So I, I think, Jay, uh, we, we were just uh, grateful to have you here yesterday for service and then last night, and obviously a great response to your ministry. One of the questions you talked about last night, and I would want to kind of hear this again, uh, the reason your ministry is called Starting Point. Tell, tell us sure. a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. Actually, we started out the ministry called the Creation Education Center. I talked about creation a lot, and sure. it was it was okay, but I got pigeonholed. Oh, oh, you're the creation guy. Been there, done that. It's too controversial. Doesn't matter. All these things. I'm like, I, I talk about a lot more than just yeah. creation, especially the authority of Scripture in general. So we decided to change the name, and we weren't sure what name to choose, but I like the concept of starting point. And the idea behind the name, the Starting Point Project, is everyone starts somewhere with their belief system. And whether they're atheist, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, Mormon, you got to start somewhere. It's impossible to not start somewhere. Right. And Christians start with the belief that God exists mm -hmm. and the Bible is his word. And then we use that starting point to define everything else, whether it's you know what science is, logic, ethics, morality, philosophy. All those things are defined by what we've chosen as our starting point or a worldview, someone else would have, perhaps have a different starting point. So you can ask them, oh, what have you chosen as your starting point? Yeah. Most people don't even realize they have one, but if they think it through, they'll come up with something, and then you can just ask them, oh, what made you choose that as a starting point, and why are you confident that that will help you accurately define everything else? And you get into these really nice conversations. It doesn't have to be combative. Right, argumentative, but you get them to realize <clears throat> whatever they've chosen as a starting point is going to color their interpretation of everything else. And if there's a problem with their starting point, their conclusions will be wrong. Yeah, so the, the starting point is basically your your premise of making all your decisions and understanding your worldview. Right. It's, I start here. <clears throat> typically when you say you believe something, you would then offer reasons as to why you sure. believe that, which means you're going even deeper to say the reason I believe this particular thing is because these things I think are true. Well, why do you think those things are true? And you might say, well, I think those things are true because you keep going deeper. At some point you reach the end of the line yeah. and you're just flat out choosing to accept something. You can't necessarily prove it because it is the lowest you can go. It's the most foundational. Everyone has those things. Like even an atheist, they assume they can trust their reasoning. Right. That's an assumption. They can't actually prove they can trust their reasoning, not without using their reasoning and trying to do so, which is certainly <laughs> reasoning. So at some point, you just flat out choose something. I assume these things are true, and I'm going to use that to define everything else. Sometimes you pick things, and they don't work well. You can still use them if you want, but there's no good reason to. They're not consistent. You have all these problems where the Christian worldview, it's consistent all the way through. Yes, we have chosen to believe that God exists in the Bible as his word, but then as we apply that as a filter to everything else, it works consistently yeah, all the way through. Definitely. So here's a, here's on another topic. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're coming out of um, February. We're going into March. This year we're celebrating Easter fairly early. Uh, and and as you said, you, you do more than just talk about creation. So in, in, your, in your mind or your understanding, what would you say are some of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sure. It's an interesting topic. It's one that I haven't had a chance to focus a whole lot on. I'm kind of someone who wants to know everything, and it's, <laughs> it's kind of difficult. Yeah. Um, but with the resurrection and a few other things that are like that, what I let people know up front is you're talking about a historical event right now. And I'll, sometimes I'll ask them, can you prove that George Washington was the first president of the United States? So, oh, yeah. I said, okay, go ahead. Well, we've got you know, these documents and things. Okay, well, we have documents, but how do you know the documents are accurate? Well, I mean, there are other people, who, they said they're accurate too. How do you know that those people are being honest? Or they, You keep going, what you find out with historical events is you don't prove them like you prove something in a laboratory. If you want to know which is more dense, cotton or lead, we can go into a laboratory and do repeat that experiment in the same conditions over and over and over. An atheistic scientist can do it. A Christian who is a scientist can do it. And we get the same results. So in a sense, we're 
proving that lead is more dense than cotton. In case you're wondering which was which, you know, <laughs> it does turn out to be lead. I would hope so. Um, so we can do that. And then people say, well, you know, prove that Jesus rose again or prove this or prove that. We can provide evidence for those things, but we're talking about a historical event, so we're not talking about going into a laboratory right, and repeating something. It's a one-time event, like the origin of the universe, origin of life, resurrection of Christ, miracles of Christ. The point is you you approach those things from a historical perspective. What are the evidences that it actually happened? And there's so many evidences that it did happen, even those who hated Jesus they didn't try to disprove that he rose from dead. They tried to write it off and explain it away or whatever, but they couldn't disprove it. And they have all these eyewitness accounts, which is why we know George Washington was right. president, because we have eyewitness accounts, written documents. So it's the same thing with the resurrection. There's so many evidences, and no other explanation makes any sense other than the, the biblical narrative. Yeah, You know, I've had experiences, uh, one where I was visiting a, a man who um, he was given a, terminal kind of doctor deal where he was he was going to die and his uh, son-in-law came to church here and he said my father-in-law has been listening to your messages and he's not a christian he's 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 terminal but he would like for you to come by and talk to him so of course i did and uh, i asked him some simple questions like do you believe in heaven and he said, oh, yeah, I believe in heaven. And I said, well, do you believe you're going to heaven? He said, no, I'm not going to heaven. And I said, well, do you believe your son-in-law is going to heaven? Oh, yeah, he's a great Christian. He loves the Lord. He da 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 He takes great care of my daughter, all this. But do you believe your daughter's going to heaven? Oh, yeah, she's going to heaven. And I said, so why aren't you going to heaven? And he goes, well, I can't believe all that stuff in the Bible. He says, Noah, the flood, Jonah swallowed by a fish and Moses parting the sea with a stick. He goes, hmm. Can't, I said, who, who told you you had to believe all that to go to heaven? And he said, what do you mean? I said, Moses, Jonah, Noah, where did you hear you had to believe in them to go to heaven? And he said, well, I just thought that you had to believe the Bible to go to heaven. So so what, what you're thinking about that as far as if someone said to you, uh, I don't believe the Bible, because here's what the end of that story was, I said, well, do you believe in Jesus? He goes, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I said, well, have you ever received him as your Lord and Savior? He said, no, I've never done that. I said, would you like to? And led him in the prayer, did his memorial service several months later. But before I left, I said this to him. I said, you know, don't be surprised when you get to heaven. If you see Jonah, Noah, (laughs) and Moses. (laughs) Right, yes. (laughs) But a lot of people have this perspective that, well, if I don't believe the whole Bible, what's your kind of thinking on that? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of people are hesitant to f- focus or talk much about Christ because they they're hung up on so many other parts parts of the Bible. Um, one approach I have is I ask them, you know, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God. We can stop right there. Do you believe that God exists? And most, most people will say yes. Right. It's okay. Once you say that, you could never, ever, ever say that something else is impossible. We're talking about God here is all powerful, so you can never later say, well, this couldn't happen. We're talking about God who's all powerful. The creation account itself was a miracle and it presents it as such. It's not saying this is how the naturalistic forces of nature came together to produce a universe. God called it into being. If he can do an entire universe, could he do these other things? It would be a miracle. It goes beyond our normal everyday experiences. But that's the whole point. If there's nothing miraculous in the Bible, then God's not impressive. <laughs> right. So I would ask them first, and they would get to realize, okay, that's true. I guess it's not impossible. I just, I can't grasp it. That's fine. I, I can't grasp a lot of that either. Yeah. But the Bible is very clear that those things happen. It was God's intervention. The other portion of that is, do you have to fully understand and believe every detail of those portions in order to get to heaven? I think the Bible's pretty clear that getting to heaven is by placing your trust in Jesus Christ alone. So I believe there will be Christians in heaven who question the parting of the Red Sea. There will be Christians in heaven who occasionally, after they accepted Christ, they were shoplifters. They were living (laughs) inconsistent with biblical narrative, but they understood the Jesus part right. So 
I talk a lot about creation and evolution. Um, I believe there will be Christians in heaven who their whole life believed in evolution. I just sure. think they were incons- inconsistent with the biblical narrative on that part. But if they're totally sincere about believing in Jesus, and I'm pretty clear with them too, it's not head knowledge. It's not just agreeing with the right. facts. It's it's personally. Yeah. The analogy that I usually use, kind of brief, is let's say there's just this horrendous person. He's a you know serial killer, rapist, all these things, and he's sentenced to life in prison or whatever. And he's he's got this bond of $2 billion, and this guy doesn't have a penny to his name. So he's, he's in prison. And a, a guy comes in who's just one of the wealthiest people on the planet, and he comes in and says, hey, I have the money to post your bail to get you out of prison. The prisoner has three options of responding. First, he could say, I don't believe it. There's no way. You know, I don't, okay, if that's his response, he stays in prison for life. Right. Second response is, he says, I have heard about you. You are filthy rich. I, I believe you could. You could post that bond. I believe that. But he leaves it there. He yeah. doesn't do anything about it. He's just agreeing this could happen. Mm-hmm. The third response is, he says, I not only believe that, I'm accepting this gift you're offering me. Thank you. And he's he's reaching out and actually receiving that gift. And so believing in Jesus, as you and I both know, isn't just agreeing with some facts. Right. It's saying I'm accepting this gift personally for me. And I, I don't just think it's possible. I'm accepting it I'm personally. Yeah. So here, let's shift gears a little sure. bit here. I, and I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse, but it certainly comes across my path a lot. Uh, we live in a culture right now that's just gone crazy in so many different ways especially in this LGBTQ, the whole gender thing. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll have conversations with people about lifestyles and choices. And, and many times you hear this. I'm sure you've heard it. I was born that way. Sure. And so what's your response to that when, you know, people have this uh, lifestyle that's either in the LGBTQ or wants to change their gender or whatever, and they go, well, I, I was just born that way. And um, so what would... Uh, Jay Seeger, the starting point project, man, <laughs> say to a guy like that. Sure. Uh, there are different angles of approaching it. One thing I ask if someone says, you know, some guy says he identifies as a woman and that's okay, or he thinks it's okay for these other two guys to get married, whatever right. it is. My first question is usually, what source of authority did you just now turn to to reach that conclusion? The conclusion that you think it's okay for these two guys to get married? what led you to that conclusion? You're obviously turning to some source of authority that brought that conclusion to your mind. And it's often, well, that's just what I feel. I think they have the right. Okay, you feel they have that right. There's someone over here you and I have never met. They might have a different opinion on that topic. So do we go by your opinion of the topic or theirs or mine or, you know, and if it's a majority vote, is it majority by country? Is it by state? Is it by city or county? And if it's by state, what do you do when you cross state lines? And even if it's by state, how often do you vote? People change their minds. You have to vote annually. It's just, it's a can of worms. It's a can of worms. And so what I do is I get them to realize they have made a statement, a a moral value statement about something, but they really have no ultimate basis for it other than this is just how I think or feel. And so I tell people, when someone brings up one of these issues, and a few years ago, you know, related to kind of COVID around that time, things had always been getting worse morally slowly, but the wheels fell off and it's just gone crazy. It's true. And it's not that any one of these issues, whether it's, it's transgenderism, gay marriage, wokeism, cancel culture, any of that, it's not that any individual issue is too hard. It's that there are too many of them. They're overwhelming the system. We're, you know, it's kind of like the guy on the st- stage spinning all the plates. He's running yeah. around and that's yeah. kind of what we're doing. And what I tell Christians is that these issues are not wrong because they turn out to be problematic. Like, oh, there's a problem with these. I guess, you know, they're wrong. They're problematic because they're wrong. They go against God's created order. Right. And then I tell Christians, no matter what issue bring they bring up, it's transgender or whatever it is, it should never be our philosophy versus theirs. Because who are we that the whole world should care what we think about these things? So someone brings an issue up, like you're bringing up, um, we should say, hold on a second, fascinating topic, let me see what the Bible says about that. And if the other person has a problem with what we're sharing, the problem isn't really with us, it's with God's Word. And another quick analogy, because this is powerful, 
let's say two people are discussing abortion, you know, pro-choice, pro-life. Sure. And so they're talking, and at one point the Christian says, well, you know, the Bible says, and then the pro-choice person jumps in and says, you got to leave your religion out of this. What they really mean is you got to leave the Bible out of this. Mm-hmm. And way too often the Christian says, well, okay, I suppose it's not fair for me to bring in, you know, my personal religious views. If you do that, you're toast. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> you're done. And here's why. You just gave up your only foundation because you believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Mm-hmm. They believe the Bible is not the inspired Word of God. They want you to give up your foundation while they keep theirs. What you should say is, hold on, I, I do believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. You don't. Let's admit our biases and go from there. Because the pro-choice person would admit if the Bible is the inspired Word of God, case closed, abortion's wrong. But they say, but I don't believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And then that's when I say, and that's the actual issue. It's not abortion. It's not transgenderism. You don't think the Bible is the inspired word of God. Yeah. If you can make some headway with that, they'll connect the dots. And they'll think, you know what? It looks like the Bible really is from God. Mm. I guess abortion then would be wrong and transgenderism would be wrong because it says male and female. They will connect the dots. We spend too much time putting Band-Aids on people, trying to stop their behavior, get them to live like a Christian when it's right. hard for Christians to live like Christians. Yes, yeah, it is. So, so you're, you've been doing this uh, for 17 years as far as ministry. You, full-time, yeah. Full-time. You, you came out of an engineering and physics uh, degrees, yeah. degrees, education. What, what was it that um, started you on this starting point to, to, to leave that behind and jump in? Was there a person? Was there a, just a, a, a God-given kind of call in your life? Was there someone who came into your life and went, wow, I want to do that? Or you know, how did you end up in this chair, so to speak? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. God, you know, he's got a huge org chart up in heaven. <laughs> he's got everything figured out. So he was, you know, preparing me my whole life, even though I was extremely shy when I was young. I would never want to speak in front of anyone all the way through college and even after. Even now, I'm still <laughs> shy unless I'm talking about this stuff. But you're talking a lot. I'm talking a lot now, yeah. I've, well, I've given 3,100 <laughs> talks since I started 39 years ago of researching and then 17 years full-time. So big picture, short is, grew up in a very solid Christian family, great you know, Bible church, You know, believe the word cover to cover, didn't add anything, didn't take anything away. My parents lived out the Christian life. So I go through public high school, don't really have any issues. I, I'm very strong in my faith. I go to a Christian college for engineering, still things going well. Then I transferred to the state university. My physics professors were telling me I was wrong about everything I believed, wow. and that made me uncomfortable because I realized I know what I believe, I don't know why. And I figured that I'm not wrong but if I'm not wrong, it means I'm right. And if I'm right, there's got to be evidence. And if there's evidence, I'm going to find it. Mm. And what's interesting is today, probably close to 78% of Christian youth end up walking away from their faith yeah. before, by the time they're like 23, whether they're in college or not. And I was you know, speaking on these things for probably almost 30 years. And I talk about the youth walking away, and I never asked myself, wait a minute, I was challenged like the youth today are being challenged. Yeah. How come I didn't walk away? It took me a half a second to figure out the answer. It was my parents. My oh, relationship wow. with my parents it was so strong. When I was challenged, I was thinking, no, I'm not wrong. I don't know why I'm not wrong, but, but I'm going to find out because I was excited about my faith. I loved my parents. I didn't want to disappoint them. And I thought, well, they're not wrong. So... Uh, skipping some details, I got connected with a guy from my church who was studying for a PhD in medical physics, mm-hmm. and he was really into the creation evolution controversy, which is what I was being you know, challenged with, with physics and all sure. that. So he loaned me two books. I devoured both of them, and I was so fired up. That was 39 years ago, and he and I still have breakfast together regularly, <laughs> which is so that's cool. Awesome. So that's how I got started being interested in the topic. Then I had regular jobs after college, Ended up having my own computer programming business, speaking on the side about 25 times a year, never charging anything, just showing up, speaking and leaving. Wanted full-time ministry. I was like sick to my stomach. I wanted it so bad, but the (laughs) doors weren't opening. But there was a time actually in Florida here. Hmm. I was invited to speak at a, I have to skip a lot of details, speak at a mega church in the Tampa area that over 5,000 people. I had never spoken, I think, on a Sunday morning before. It's just Bible studies, Sunday schools and all It was just a total miracle that this opportunity came up, and it went so well 
And while I was doing that engagement, I sensed God saying, now is the time I want you in full-time ministry. Wow. It was so, I didn't hear a voice, but it was so clear. I went home, I talked to my wife and she sensed it too. So I had to shut down my computer programming business, move into full-time ministry, which I knew nothing about. Yeah, big step. Going from doing well financially to not charging anything for what we do, <laughs> total step of faith. Now it's 17 years later, but God put that fire in my heart, and it's just exciting to be able to reach out to others who I know are struggling with, you know, tough questions and yeah. how to defend the Christian worldview. So, so it kind of started in state college where you wanted to defend what you believe, right? And there's a friend who gave you a couple of books, parents who were anchors in your life, yes. so to speak. You didn't want to disappoint them. You know, I, I don't think sometimes parents realize the influence they have. If if they can maintain uh, the respect and the relationship with their children and live the Christian life in a way that uh, is real, that it's very difficult, I think, for a child to turn their back on that if they if they see reality without hypocrisy. And you know, my wife and I, of course, we. We have three kids. We we uh, got married, um, you know, right out of Bible college, and one of the things that was was in our heart was we don't ever want to do church work. We want to serve the Lord mm. and do do real ministry, not just have a church. And my my life was never to plant a church. I didn't see myself as that kind of individual. I wasn't like this guy who wanted to get out there and <laughs> you know plant a church. I was going to work my way up the ladder and circumstances uh, were created and such that it was like God put me in this little box and said, no, this is what you're going to do. And so one of the things I tried to do with our kids was obviously be real here and at home. And the other was to expose them to as much Christianity outside of our circle as I could. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted them to see that Jesus was real all over the world and all over the place it wasn't just mom and dad's thing and um so far <laughs> <laughs> they're walking with the lord and uh I, I think though the the parents sometimes will take kids and say, oh let's put them in church let's put them in a christian school but they kind of live this half-hearted christianity and think well they're going to take care of it for me and usually it ends in a disaster <laughs> it, it does i'm glad you brought that up because when people think about apologetics and defending the Christian worldview, it plays a part. It's important to know why we believe. We're, God doesn't say, hey, if you get a chance to look into some of this stuff, he commands us to be ready to have an answer, First right. Peter 3.15. So that's important, but too many parents think, well, that's why you bring them to church because they're going to learn all that and they'll be fine. It's like, no, it's our job as parents to be mentoring our ch children. That doesn't mean sit them down and give them a lecture. If been there, done that, it doesn't work. <laughs> no. It means... When they rise up, when they sit down, when you meal, you just you share life. And uh, I think what Josh McDowell said, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Totally. And a lot of Christians or parents are really big on the rules, you know, do this, don't do that. And that's all their kids know is do this, don't do that. And they don't really see the life being lived out in their parents. And this this is fascinating. I have so many instances where I'll be at a church and I talk about youth walking away from their faith and then I will have parents afterwards coming up to me saying, you you mentioned, you know, the children walking away yeah. from their faith. That was our son, Billy. You know, he grew up in the church and went to youth group and all this. He went off to college. He comes back an atheist and he's walked away from his faith. And they said, can you fix him in a sense? <laughs> right. And what they mean is, you just talked about all that really cool DNA stuff. Could you tell Billy that? And you'll say, oh, I didn't know that. I'm going back to church to worship Jesus. Right. I say, that's not how it works. Um, and I said college really wasn't the problem. College just exposed the problems that were developing over time. And I'll give you an analogy that I came up with because it's pretty powerful and it wakes parents up. So this is, not, I don't want to paint with a too broad of a brush sure. of a Christian home. But what can happen too often is within a Christian home, um, it's Sunday morning, everyone's getting ready to go to church and dad's walking down the hallway and he sees little Billy still laying in bed and he's like, we got to leave in eight minutes. You're still in bed. You know, there's just all the tension Sunday morning. You can't be late. <laughs> Looks bad. Right. So Billy gets up and he gets ready and they're going to church and there's tension in the car. And as soon as they get to the church, the parents are, oh, hi. Yeah. Are <laughs> the kids are rolling their eyes like, yeah, if you'd have just seen him screaming at us in right. the car. And they go off to their Sunday school class and the parents go to theirs. And the Sunday school class, it's okay. You know, they've got their friends there and it's whatever. 
Then they go into the service afterwards, and the pastor says, the apostle Paul says, you know, and they're like, yeah, it's just, it's church. It's what you do. It's, church, it's okay. Yeah. Then you go home, and from Sunday afternoon to the next Sunday morning has nothing to do with Christianity at home. Right. And then in that context, little Billy knows how upset his parents get when his room is a mess. They just kind of go through the roof, and he's thinking, if they knew I was smoking pot, oh, my word, they'd kill me. Yeah. So he learns kind of how to hide that. And whatever it is, it's just an example. There could be other things going on. And he f feels guilty. He feels attention. He's got to kind of live a double life here. And then um, he's going to do something with his friends from the public junior high, high school, or whatever. And his parents say, no, you're not hanging out with them. you got to hang out with the kids in the youth group. Billy's thinking, it's the kids in the youth group who got me smoking pot. <laughs> <clears throat> not my friends you know, at the public school. But he can't tell on his friends. Yeah, so. So you just have all this going on. And then they go off to college. And now freedom. They don't have their parents, you know, breathing, you know, down right, their neck right. and all this. And all their friends are doing whatever they want. And that looks fun. And they have professors now telling them all that whole Bible stuff. You just, you forget that. You are in college to learn real truth, to live in a real world, get a real job. Right. Forget that, you know mythological stuff with that Bible that's outdated and been disproved and all these different versions and errors and contradictions and science has disproven the creation code. There never was a flood. All <laughs> and little Billy now is like, yes, I knew it. I knew that it really wasn't true. Now I don't have to feel guilty. They go off and do what they want. And the parents tell me, can you tell Billy about the DNA stuff? And he'll be back. It's like, no, he's long gone. He's long gone. Yeah. He doesn't want to come back. Whereas a child who has been nurtured at home and love their parents have a good relationship right. they go off and they're challenged and they're like i don't have answers i want answers and then they talk to their parents or friends or pastor and they get answers mm -hmm. it typically goes a lot better that way so parents have yeah, a huge consistency i i know uh, i i was you shared in in your one of your messages about um, poetic literal different ways that the Bible is written mm -hmm. and explained. And I remember one time I, I shared that proverb, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And I was with a group of, I think, men, and I said, you know, this isn't a promise. It's it's a proverb. Yeah. It doesn't mean that if you take your kid to church every Sunday, and, and this one guy got very angry at me, he said, well, that, that's I believe that, you know, I've taken my child to church, and da-da-da-da-da, and so I know he's a prodigal, but because of this, I said, well, uh, that's not a promise. It's a proverb. It's a and, general principle. And I said, you know, yeah, it's a general principle that's couched in a proverb, but it doesn't mean that you can hold God captive because of this verse for your child. He goes, well, I, you know, you get really angry, like, you're wrong about that. And I go, well, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. people sometimes get all confused about Scripture, as you were saying, it's written in ways that's not always literal. Right, yeah, it is it is a general principle. It's not a formula. Right. If it was a formula, I would tell you there's errors in the Bible because there are many Christian parents who have done actually a really good job and their kids bolt because their kids have a free will, free will and they can make a decision. You have other parents sometimes who have done a terrible job and yet their children turn out wonderful because the children have a choice. So right. it is a general principle that if you do this, this is a, you know the fruit that you yeah. will most likely see, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah. So so as we close this out, um, you 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 travel all over, you 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 speak on all kinds of topics. What's your most passionate topic that that you <laughs> really love to talk about? Sure. Um, it certainly started out being creation, and I, I, I do. I get excited talking about creation to show people that creation isn't just true in general. Like every detail that's in, in Genesis and other, other chapters and books is actually true with there being one male and one female. So I go into the genetics of that and say, sure. yeah, science is catching up. I'm like, okay, that's true. Um, almost everyone on the planet was wiped out not long ago. We started repopulating the planet, the, the flood thing. They're finding genetic evidence for that. There's genetic evidence that there are like three major groups of people on the planet. When you take the genetics of all people, mm -hmm. they fall into like these three major categories. <laughs> you got three sons coming off the ark with three wives, <laughs> and so you're going to produce. So I like to talk about those things to say this is exciting. The Bible yeah. has always been right, and science is catching up to say, wow, it's true. So I am excited about that. 
But when people die and face God, he's not going to say, did you believe in evolution? No, okay, come on in. Yeah. It's all going to be about Jesus. And so what I found out, my most exciting topic is teaching people that the Bible is the inspired word of God, cover to cover, every single thing. Therefore, whatever touches on is true. So you can trust the creation account because scripture is inspired. You can trust the flood. You can trust the resurrection. You can trust the return of Christ, all these things, because the Bible is truly the inspired word of God. That's our starting point. So when someone brings up transgenderism, you can ask the person who's bringing that up or whatever topic, what makes more sense? That if we were to die and stand before God, that he will judge us based on whatever standard we made up or would he judge us on his own standard? Every single person to this date has said it makes more sense that God would use his own standard sure. to judge us. So I, I agree with that. So then it would be pretty important to find out what his standard is, right? Yeah. <laughs> I said, the Bible is making the claim that this is his standard. I said, no, I could write a book tonight claiming that this is a standard. I just couldn't back it up. But the Bible can. And so by showing people this truly is, not only claims to be God's standard for us, but there's evidence for that. Therefore, no matter what topic comes up, the transgenderism, gay marriage, wokeism, cancel culture, abortion, we can always go back to saying, here's why I have this particular view on that topic. Not because I've thought through it and this is kind of what I'd like to see or make sense. Right. Um, it's because this is what Scripture is telling me and this is my only foundation, but I can defend it versus yours. Like, well, I just feel this. I just think that. And it's fine, but feelings change and other people have different yeah. feelings. So Christianity is the only one who presents this consistent sound fundamental foundation to judge whether it's something right or wrong so here's the final question sure. <laughs> you you shared some slides powerpoint of uh, the hubble telescope sure uh, going out into the universe and thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies out there uh, what in the world's out there jay <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of God's glory, it, there's a lot of comments I could make right now. Some people will say, if we're the only life forms here, and I won't go into that right now, I believe... It's wasted space, is that what Well, yeah, <laughs> I know. That's, that's their point because, you know, God's very clear. 1 Corinthians fifteen forty five. Adam was the first man. There were no men before Adam because the scripture says Adam was the first man. And Eve is the mother of all the living. There are a lot of reasons to come to the conclusion that we're the only humans in the universe. God made this area special for us to live on this planet. Right. There's no verses in the Bible that says, I, God, absolutely did not create any other form of life anywhere else in the universe. No, there's not. But there's nothing that hints at that. So we really don't have a reason biblically to think there are other life forms out there. It certainly can't be people because it would have had to come from Eve. Um, hmm. But there's no biblical reasons to really believe that, yes, there's all these other life forms out there. And scientifically, I'll skip that for now. There's no evidence from science that alien life exists. A right. lot of reasons against that. But then the skeptic would say, okay, if we're the only life forms just on this planet, why did God make such a big universe? And one of the approaches I use for that is as big as it is, and it is massive, billions and billions of galaxies, and it's just go on and on how amazing it is. As big as amazing as it is, people still deny that God did that. Oh, that could just happen by accident. Would a smaller universe have done a better job? <laughs> so I humorously say, I think God had to use every bit of his might to hold himself back and only make it this big. <laughs> you know, yeah. This is nothing. This just gives us a glimpse of God's glory. This is amazing. Um, so it helps us appreciate if God can call all that into existence. We, we can't even create a water molecule. We, can't, we can take a living cell. We know all the parts. We can take them apart. We can't put them back together and have it be living anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't even do that. God called all this into existence out of nothing. That gives you a little bit of glimpse of who he is, and it should give us awe when we think about him and respect for his word. <laughs> all right. Well, Jay Seeger, Starting Point Project, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for <laughs> having me on the program.